I was a little kid, I grew up in Boston, and there were many Catholic churches around, and those are the types of churches that my family and I attended to. My mom used to get us all ready, myself and my two brothers, we would go out to the Catholic church every Sunday without fail. We would go there, and as I was a kid, I would sit there, and I never found it interesting at all. In fact, I despised it. Uh, I, I just thought that they, you know, doing the same thing every week. Nothing was new. I didn't feel like I was learning anything. I felt like it was something I had to do. And even the teachings, I just felt like, you know, it was all about rules and do this and do that and be a good person. And it just never really clicked for me. And so, you know, I went through it all. My mom was my Sunday school teacher, bless her heart. You know, she would teach the lessons on Sundays and even on weeks that we were away from church, maybe we were camping, you know, for, for summer vacation. Before we went out and had fun, my mom would be reading us children's Bible stories in the camper before we went out. I mean, it was a part of our life. Now, as I got older, it became my own decision, right? So at 16 years old, Catholics have this thing called confirmation where you are confirmed. And for me at the time, at 16 years old, the only thing that confirmed for me was that I was never going to church again. Yeehaw! Hallelujah! That's the first time I said hallelujah in my life, really. Now, I had never stepped into a church other than a funeral or a wedding from that point on until my 30s. About 15 years, I hadn't stepped into a church. During those times, I pretty much was, you know, on my own and doing things myself and everything that got done was because of me. Uh, I had hard work, I had work ethic, and I did all these things to get ahead in college. And that brought me to, you know, graduating college. And when graduating college with an engineering degree, I did very well for myself as a young professional. It led me to having all the things that society and our culture deem as success. Uh, you know, you had the money, you had the big house. I had a 3,500 square foot house. 20 foot ceilings with this huge stone fireplace that went all the way up to the top of the ceiling. We had a media room that was like a home theater. It had multiple levels with stadium seating, 120 inch pull down screen. We had a game room with a you know, pool table. It, it, was, it was off the charts, right? Had that, had the BMW convertible, had all the things that society tells you that you're successful. But yet, even with all that and being a happy-go-lucky person, I still felt like there was something missing inside of me and I was chasing the wrong things. Now, at this time, through all this time in my life, I despised church, I despised religion, I even despised the people that were parts of it. If you wanted to talk about God or you wanted to tell me what was happening in your life with God, I stayed away from people that talked about that. I would look at people that had faith as people that were weak, that needed a crutch, that couldn't do things on their own. And that was my view of not only God, but people who supposedly followed God. And then in late 2007, my life began to change. A friend of mine, uh, we were going on a business trip, and he showed up at the airport and brought me a Bible with my name on it. I mean, it was inscripted in gold, right? I mean, this is really cool. Now, as a kid, I always did have a curiosity of the Bible. I always wanted to read it and understand it, but I felt like it was gibberish. I could never understand. I felt like I was reading a Shakespeare novel, right? I could never understand anything. Well, this version of the Bible not only had my name on it, it was specifically for me, but it was written in English. I could actually read it and understand it. And not only that, it actually had a lot of application notes as to, hey, what does this mean? What are the different possibilities that this might mean? And what does it mean to you? And really, how do you really apply this to your life? And it was something I had never experienced before. And I thought it was really cool. So my friend that gave me this Bible invited me to church and I didn't think I was gonna go. I was driving for 45 minutes to get there and on the way there, I'm thinking I'm never going here again. And I got there and it was like, it was a non-denominational church. It was very modern. They had like a rock band with lights going up and down. They used movie screens with cool videos to, to teach messages, to show how different things relate to you. And it was completely different from the regimented Catholic mass that I was accustomed to all my life. And it was so different. And for me, it spoke to me, it was so refreshing. And I remember sitting there the first day I went there and the pastor was talking and they did communion and I felt the Holy Spirit come upon me and I just started to weep there, realizing that he's calling my name and I'm exactly where I need to be. Now over those next six months of reading the Bible, I was so excited about what I had found and learned in it, 
that I wanted other people who had the same experience that was so turned off to it by, by one point that they could actually understand this. So I began to write a book of summarizing all the cool things that I learned. It was called Apply Daily rinse and repeat and it was a non-intimidating sort of daily devotional way to to understand what the bible is about without having to be intimidated by this big large book and that was sort of a journey that i was going on at this time of my life and the church itself you know i was so excited because finally i was being taught that there's actually this relationship what a relationship with our heavenly father actually is and what it looks like and how you live with it and it's not about rules but it's about the relationship at that point, I got turned into what's called a small group or a life group where kids of your age uh, or, or demographics, they, they get together and they study the Word of God and they understand how do you live? How do you live life together? How do you take the scripture and apply it to your lives? Well, I was so scared. I was driving to my first one ever that I'd ever been to in my life. And on the way there, I got the call that my grandfather back east had passed away. And I was crying and I, I wanted to pull off the side of the road. I wanted to go home. It easily could have and it would have been a good excuse, but something kept telling me to go just keep going and so I drove up to that small group and I get there and uh, it was an amazing experience and that was the place that I met my future wife who then we started leading a small life group right after that has blown up into some great things now at this point in my life I was leading and volunteering for a Greyhound rescue and adoption uh, nonprofit called Fast Dogs Fast Friends and we were what we did was we got greyhounds off the tracks and we got them into foster homes and we got them adopted. It was a win-win situation for the dogs and the people, but it was really hard to keep volunteers. It's hard to bring dogs into your house that cause all sorts of chaos, that, that need some love, they need to learn how, how, how to be you know, a pet as opposed to a piece of business on the racetrack. You know, and then people fall in love with them and they want to keep them. And so it's a really hard job to keep these volunteers. And I was praying and praying and praying. I'm like, you know, first time in my life, I'm really trying to pray for real. And I'm praying to God, please bring me some more volunteers. Pray, please bring me some more volunteers. And, and I was silent. And then we had a sermon that my, my preacher, Cal Jernigan, spoke. And he said, you know, if you're just wondering about God or exploring about God, you got to get over the cross. You got to get over the fact that you'll never be good enough, that Jesus did it all for us. And once we understand the sacrifice that he made for us, we can get over that cross and start believing in him. But then once we're there, we don't stop. Then, as Luke 9.23 says, we've got to deny ourselves daily and pick up your cross and follow him. So we got to get under the cross. And one way of getting under the cross is, is the nature of your prayers. And you don't pray, Lord, bless me, bless me. Your prayers turn into, Lord, how can I bless you? And I was captivated by this. And I went home and I changed my prayer. And I said, okay, Lord, let's see if this works. I want to bless you. I've been praying for volunteers. It's not working. Show me how I can bless you through all this. The very next week, I'm at church. I, I'm in the store. I'm in a band at the time. And the, the drummer uh, was a pastor himself. And I saw a shirt there, one of those cheesy Christian shirts that had drumsticks on it like this, and it said, stick with Jesus. And I just thought it was a funny, cute thing to get for him. So I'm waiting in line uh, at the bookstore at the church, and I'm getting this, 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 this shirt for my buddy, and I get towards the front. I see a picture of a greyhound down in the, in, in the corner there by the, by, by the register. And I go and I grab it. And it, it was a magazine called Prison Living. It was a prison living magazine. In there was an article of how this lady in Florida started this program called Second Chance at Life, where they took these greyhounds and they brought them into the prisons and they taught these inmates how to become dog trainers, gave them a sense, gave them a purpose, gave them something to do with their times and gave them a skill for something that they can do when they get out. I was just captivated. At the same time, it's a foster home, right? For the, they're there 24 hours with the dogs and my gosh, when I read that thing, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I called the number, I talked to her, I told her how I found her. And this is where my life really changed. She said, Dan, I've been praying to Jesus to bring a young, energetic person out on the West Coast to help grow this program around the country. I was filled up with tears. My, my arms, my hair was standing up. I mean, it stands up every time I tell this story. It was just the most amazing testimony of how God was working in my life. Now to make a long story short, we, I, did, I was able to get this program implemented and we've had hundreds of dogs go through. We've, we, we've serviced many inmates. Some of them have even got out and have, have started uh, training businesses for dogs, dog grooming businesses. I mean, it is a true testament as to what this program can do in the hearts of inmates and really make them different people. Just to show you what, what happens with this, look at some of these things that these inmates wrote in their journals about the experiences they had while caring for these dogs.
Now that journey through that prison program was so touching to me that it was that point that I decided to surrender my life and give my life up to Christ and commit to follow Him publicly, and it led to this. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Campbell, and I'm uh, pleased to uh, baptize my good friend Ed King here uh, this afternoon. Uh, Ed and I have been good friends for a few years, and uh, it's a good, good day for you. Um, we've been good friends for a few years, and it was last year during the holidays that he approached me and mentioned that he felt that something was missing in his life, and so I bought him a Bible as an early Christmas present, and he got it on December 7th, if I remember correctly, and he's been reading it ever since, and uh, he started coming to church with me every week. And um, then he started to join the Bible study, and uh, he met his wonderful girlfriend, Denise. And since then, they've kind of just taken off, and they've spun off, and they run their own Bible study today. And uh, Denise, if you could help me baptize them, that'd be great. Yeah, he believed that Jesus Christ was the son of the living God. Yes. And he And they say that you are a new creation after baptism, and I totally felt that in my life. I felt like I was a new person. The old went away, the new came in, and the old me of looking down on people and being conceited and always uh, you know, doing things for selfish reasons, and I learned through this that there's more to life than me. And if you take those things that you are good at, that you have been blessed with, that you have been gifted with, and you take those and you turn them around to help others, and use your time, talents, and treasures to pour into other people's lives, to make difference in them. It just changes your whole outlook on life. And for me, that was that prison program with the dogs and the greyhounds and, and putting the inmates together with them. It was using my musical skills and, and starting a group called Diffraction, which was then nominated for the Los Angeles Music Awards Christian Artist of the Year. It's using my skills to, to lead a life group with my wife and to pour into other people's. It's to teach a Dave Ramsey class on Financial Peace University and be able to to get your finances together because you can't help poor people if you're broke. So how do we get to live like no one else so later we can live and give like no one else? Whether it's you know meeting someone when you're serving at the Phoenix Rescue Mission and, and, and helping them get some tools so that they can then get a job with DirecTV being a, uh, an installation person for them. It's you know giving a home makeover to a family of 10 that had nothing and rallying a community around this and leading that to allow them to experience what a home feels like instead of just an empty house. Or maybe it's bringing home a stranded UFC fighter, making his ways up the ranks on a Thanksgiving night from the airport and bringing them in. See, you gotta figure out what your talents and treasures are and allow God to use them and amazing things will happen. You see, a lot of people find Jesus when they're at their lowest point, when they're at rock bottom. And that happens a lot. But for me, it happened at a good point in my life when I thought I had it all together. I thought I had everything right. And society was telling me that I had everything right. But see, just because you think you've got it right doesn't mean your heart's in the right spot. And I believe that even when things look right, if you turn to Jesus, He will change your life. He will change your entire perspective on everything. And the people around you will be so glorified by getting His love through you. I'm Dan King, and this is my story.